Hi, everyone. This is the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour, and I am uh, Eve Engler. Uh, I'm coming to you from uh, Jojage, which has long been a meeting place of various First Nations, otherwise known as Montreal. And uh, this is about the uh, 75th, 80th uh, uh, session, a uh, weekly roundup on, uh, on Canada's uh, role internationally from a critical perspective. And tonight we're going to be focusing on the uh, Canada's complicity in uh, genocide uh, in, uh, for the Palestinians in Gaza. Uh, but before getting to that, I thought just quick, a few updates on other developments in Canadian foreign policy. We have, um, there's a rally tomorrow in Ottawa, the CARICOM conference is taking place uh, with Canadian officials where they're going to be, Canada is going to be pressing the Caribbean countries to join the mission to Haiti. And so uh, Solidarité Québec Haïti and some uh, different groups in Ottawa have a rally planned for 4 p.m. Uh, if anyone's in Ottawa, uh, if you can, please make it out to, uh, to that. Uh, Global News today is reporting that Chinese military jet, jet aggressively intercepts Canadian Armed Forces plane. Um, the aggressive interception, of course, was not anywhere near Canadian territorial waters or airspace. It was uh, right near Chinese airspace, and a Canadian Aurora spy aircraft was apparently um, uh, intercepted by uh, Chinese uh, fighter jets. This is not the first time we've obviously we've talked about the uh, naval vessels, Canadian naval vessels going near Chinese territorial waters, and uh, and the response from the Chinese Navy. Um, and we're seeing another example of that with the with the Air Force. Uh, the Canadians claim they're they're just trying to uh, uh, fulfill uh, Operation Neon, which is the sanctions on North Korea. Uh, but clearly, the Chinese are not uh, are not confused by that. The with regards to Ukraine, uh, Bill Blair, the uh, new Defense Minister, announced uh, that uh, Canada would uh, support for as long as it takes. Uh, Ukraine can count on Canada's support for as long as it takes, um, which is a increasingly uh, meaningless and, and I, in fact, I'd say troubling uh, comment because it just means prolonging this war that is pretty clear is not, Ukraine is not taking the bulk of its territory back. A former top advisor to Zelensky uh, said as much, uh, yesterday or a couple of days ago now, uh, basically saying that the counteroffensive is a disaster. And uh, and now uh, Putin is boasting that Russian troops are actually capturing more territory. Uh, but from a Canadian perspective, U.S. perspective, prolonging this war is not necessarily uh, a bad thing, just like provoking it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, the forward the uh, New York-based uh, uh, Jewish publication published a story titled Canadian government has given 2 million to, to Ukrainian Canadian groups that celebrate Nazi collaborators over the past, I think it was past five or six years, uh, according to the story. Uh, obviously, this is just more fallout from the Nazi gate that, that, uh, that it now seems you know, kind of far off of the, the news agenda. But uh, the story basically goes through the Canadian funding to groups that are, you know, explicitly celebrating the Waffen uh, SS, the uh, Galicia uh, uh, division, the uh, that uh, uh, Honka, Yaroslav Honka was was uh, was part of the individual who was celebrated in the House of Commons a few weeks ago, and uh, so we'll see where where this goes. But um, but this Canada and the far right Ukrainian Canadian groups. There is a uh, you know government money going into these groups, as we know, but this is just a sort of updating from some of the work that people like Richard Sanders and others have done in documenting that um, that dynamic. Um, so what we have going on uh, in uh, Gaza, I think, uh, is is a uh, certainly uh, fits 
crimes against humanity under international law and may well be genocide. And um, in the last week or so, Israel has launched uh, 6,000 rockets, more than 6,000 rockets at a territory about the size of Montreal, uh, with about 3,000 Palestinian dead from its onslaught over the past week or so, uh, about 1,000 children, something like a million, but something like half the population has been displaced. The, the uh, government officials have been pretty clear about their, certainly their collective punishment, but their, their intent to starve, cut off electricity, cut off water, cut off fuel. Uh, they're open about it. The defense minister, Israeli defense minister, announced this openly. We're shutting, we're you know, cutting all this stuff off. He said, um, uh, Gaza won't return to what it was before. We will eliminate everything. And similar type comments, the Israeli president said, there are no civilians in Gaza because they didn't overthrow the Hamas government. So there's no civilians in Gaza. In the Globe and Mail, they quoted uh, this person from a kibbutz saying, the retaliation we're expecting is literally the annihilation of the entire strip with no pushback in the Globe and Mail. The, Rez Segal, who is a, uh, has a piece in Jewish Currents, U.S. Uh, a lefty uh, Jewish publication, where he's, a, he's the prof of genocide studies, the chair of genocide studies at um, one of the Mer one of the U.S. university. And he basically details how what Israel's doing is genocidal and how it fits the um, definition of uh, genocide under uh, uh, international law. And uh, so this is what's, uh, what's going on. Um, and uh, the, the uh, uh, Canadian government is, is uh, enabling this in, uh, in many ways. I'm gonna try to share a video, excuse me a second here. Maybe I'm not. And so uh, maybe I'll share this in a second. Um, and so, so the Canadian government is is uh, is enabling this. They refuse to um, they refuse to uh, uh, criticize Israel's policies. They yeah, I'm share this now. Minister Minister Vasquez, are you willing to you condemn Hamas's crime? Are you willing to condemn Israel's crimes against humanity in Gaza? You, you've criticized Israel's uh, uh, Hamas, but you won't criticize the genocidal policies that Israel's committing. There's a lot of multiple thousands trying to starve the population. Minister Vasquez, why can't you criticize that? These are genocidal policies. Your government is your government is encouraging those policies. You yourself are encouraging them. Why can't you criticize that? Why can't you criticize the Israel's war crimes? <laughs> Melanie Jolie just went there to support Israel's Israel's crimes. <laughs> Why, why can't you condemn the crimes? Your government, the Trudeau government has been promoting Israel left and right, organized a peace party. 
for, for Canadians yeah. fighting in the IDF, voted against yeah. more than the yeah. yeah. UN yeah. resolution, yeah. critical, yeah. critical yeah. of, yeah. critical yeah. of, yeah. of, yeah. of uh, yeah. the yeah. Palestinians. Yeah. Right? I have a question for the minister. There's there, 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 policy yeah. taking place, yeah. and you can criticize that. Why not? So that was uh, that was um, myself and uh, Laurel Thompson, who's a regular on Canadian Foreign Policy Hour earlier today, with the um, uh, small business and new small business minister uh, Vasquez, uh, who who of course has criticized what Hamas did, uh, but is refusing, uh, as you saw, refused to say anything critical about what Israel's done, and that's been the position of the Canadian government. Um, they they repeatedly Trudeau's been asked, uh, other ministers have been asked, uh, anything critical uh, in the House of Commons. I uh, just saw a clip from the NDP foreign affairs critic Heather McPherson, where she she asks uh, uh, the government to call for a ceasefire, and Christian Friedland responds by saying um, that uh, just won't don't won't call for a ceasefire, and and. Uh, so that fits. This is multiple occasions. The the uh, um, the Globe and Mail uh, business section had a story uh, titled on Saturday. However, the Israel Hamas war ends. There is one big winner: the defense sector, uh, and uh, that partly explains why the U.S. administration, Biden administration, sent a memo. An internal memo that came out that saying not to use the word ceasefire and Blinken actually tweeted obviously it wasn't him but somebody in his staff tweeted mentioning a ceasefire after talking to Turkish president and then deleted the tweet that mentioned the ceasefire so Canadian American officials they won't talk about ceasefire I think there's many much bigger politics than just the arms industry but one factor in all this of course is that the arms industry does well by war and the people who lead <laughs> lead our governments are are you know are happy to see more uh, more warfare. Now, as I mentioned in the in that clip uh, earlier today, uh, uh, um, uh, Melanie Jolie went to Israel on Friday, and uh, she she said she re reiterated Canada's uh, support for Israel's right to self defense, and the her counterpart that she met with, the uh, Ellie Cohen. Israeli foreign minister said, we continue to mobilize the world for the fight against Hamas. I met today with Canada's foreign minister, Melanie, J Melanie Jolie, who also came to support Israel. So very clearly, they see this visit as a green lighting, what they're doing in, 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 uh, in Gaza, in, in, the, uh, in the genocidal uh, policies, the siege, the further siege, longstanding siege, but the siege has been further tightened, and, and, the, and the violence. Um, and, and there's all kinds of crazy stories floating around. Well, Seymour Hirsch has one about what Israel plans to do. There's talk about the ground, if you went ground evasion and some of the things could lead to like up to 100,000 deaths. And then there's this plan for these wild, um, according to Seymour Hirsch, the bunker busting bombs, because of course, Hamas, um, there's tunnels down below. So, so that's much of the resistance is going to come from down below. And and so if you don't want to go house to house and door to door, the Israeli military doesn't want to do that. If they can avoid it, then you just drop, drop these wild bombs and just you know, blow up everything, including multiple stories uh, down below uh, to blow up the tunnels. Um, it's pretty it's all pretty wild. Uh, obviously, what's already happened is pretty wild. And, and um, the, the possibility this could even be you know, certainly continued and possibly escalated is, is, is really crazy. Now, the, the Canadian uh, uh, media has, has been endorsing this, right? The uh, uh, Davide uh, Mastriche has a piece uh, for, uh, for uh, the Maple uh, where he talks about, he lists all the colonists that have endorsed Israel's genocidal policies. And uh, I, I read the first version, he, I just saw he just updated it today. Um, so there's a, a handful more people can go check that out online. And uh, they're all these crazy wild, uh, you know, the commentary uh, backing this. 
uh, as they've backed previous wars and previous uh, you know, US Canadian wars, and of course, Israel. Um, you know, one of the things in the media coverage that is pretty stark uh, that I've pointed out a couple of places, and I, and I think it's viewed as very controversial, but it, I think still important, is that reportedly, and not in many places, but reportedly, Israel has 15 bodies of 1,500 Palestinian fighters, okay? So when we hear the number of like, it's now the official number is like 2,900 and there's like 1,000 Palestinians still under the rubble. So it's certainly higher than that, 3,000 plus dead. It doesn't include the 1,500 uh, uh, Palestinian fighters that Israel has their bodies that went in you know, as part of the operation. And there's, there's all kinds of parts to this that I find kind of interesting. So that, that means that probably at every moment of the past, you know, since the Saturday operation, at every moment, there was probably more Palestinians that had died in, 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 in this nine days of violence than Israeli that died, which is, which is, which is you know, I think, relevant because the idea was early on, it was all Israelis that were killed, and then now it's the you know, retribution. But, but there, possibly there's as many Palestinians killed at every stage or more at every stage. But on top of that, I've only seen one Canadian media that mentions the 1,500 Palestinians uh, that are the, Israel has their bodies. Israel in the past has used Palestinian uh, bodies to, for leverage, to exchange, stuff like that. I don't know if that's what's happening now. Obviously, what, all of what's happened recently is at such a greater scale than usual that all these sort of dynamics are different. Um, but there's been basically no attention given to these one K media I said that I've seen mentioned that 1,500 Palestinians that Israel's bodies that they have. Presumably, Israel also has some captured uh, Hamas fighters as well. You don't hear much about that. Um, now, the one Canadian who was killed, was a Vancouverite that got the initial attention, who was killed, has received way more attention than the 1,500 Hamas fighters. Now, the Vancouverite that was killed, a 22-year-old, he was killed at the rave, okay? But he went to a private school that took them to Israel, private Jewish school in Vancouver, took them to Israel, and, and, and he joined the IDF after high school. So he went to go from Vancouver, you know, halfway across the world to join the IDF. He has received way more attention than all the Palestinian, 1,500 Palestinians. Now, those Palestinians from Gaza, they're almost all young men. Uh, this was probably in almost all their cases, the first time they ever left the Gaza cage, right? First time in life. Um, and, and clearly, I think by anybody who sits and thinks about it for two seconds, they are bigger victims of this conflict than the 22-year-old. I mean, I guess everyone who's died is equal victim in a sense. But if you're going to look at it at a kind of more macro level, more political level, the, they're bigger victims of this conflict than the 22-year-old who went to private school in Vancouver and then decided to go half across the world to join another country's military. Even if he was ultimately, I think, you know, people being killed at a raid is obviously, you know, that's a war crime and, 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 uh, and horrible. But the media focus on that, just so overwhelming versus um, uh, this other piece. So there's many other aspects of the media uh, uh, coverage that's worth looking at. Uh, there's the, the stuff about rapes. There's no evidence around the rape and the, and the rapes don't actually make sense because if you think about what, what Hamas was doing, they knew that the clock was ticking, right? They knew they had very, they, I think they were surprised at how successful they were. Uh, they don't, I don't think they expected to be as, to have the, the Israeli military uh, Gaza facilities collapsed so easily. Um, and so, so they were surprised. They were basically, they were, they were, the clock was ticking. So the rape allegations never made any sense. It, it, it was just propaganda. Uh, the babies, the 40 babies butchered, their, their ha heads cut off, that story that is also collapsed, right? Uh, that doesn't make sense. I, I think there were, there clearly were Israeli babies that were killed. 
Um, but this idea of this like mass butchering of, of, you know, lining up and beheading 40 babies and this, all this kind of wild stuff that went, went, went around. And now the media is kind of a, even apologized in some cases they have actually even drawn it all back and, and, and apologize. There's also, I just read a story, uh, electronic intifada based upon, uh, um, this, this interview with one of the people who was at the rave, who then goes to the uh, kibbutz, uh, that was attacked. Uh, she talks about how a lot of the people of the kibbutz were actually killed by the IDF, the civilians, because they came in like guns a blazing and, 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 um, and there was a bunch of Israelis killed in the crossfire, according to her. And um, so that also makes a, some, a bit of sense to me as well. That's not, again, to, that's not to say that Hamas didn't kill civilians. That's not to say that Hamas, um, you know, was, was going and, and, and just following the rules of war or anything like that. But, but the, the, from what I can tell, not having followed very closely, but having read a decent amount, um, that they, this was a brutal operation, but far less brutal than, than uh, the, the Israeli propaganda wants to frame it as. And the Canadian media has basically followed the, the Israeli uh, uh, propaganda. Uh, Mark McKinnon, the Globe and Mail international uh, correspondent, uh, he's usually actually in, in Europe, and he, he, um, he's uh, been sent on the ground. He had a piece, I think, on Thursday that starts off by saying, Kibbutz Berry was a symbol of the Israeli national dream. The, the desire and ability to make the desert bloom. This tiny oasis of greeny, greenery on the edge of the ne Negev desert was one of the most affluent of its kind and one of the few kibbutzum that remained true to the cooperative principles it was founded upon in 1946, two years before the state of Israel itself. This is this make the desert bloom. This is right out of the like totally uh, discredited Zionist mythology that there was nobody, it was a, you know, a, a land uh, without people for people without land. I mean, this is just totally unbelievable that in 2023, 2023, somebody who's like sort of a supposedly sophisticated, not, you know, a Toronto Sun propagandist, but a serious international journalist uh, uses that kind of language. Now, I guarantee you, if you were to read the Globe and Mail, if you do the search of the Globe and Mail, you'll find that they've used the desert bloom, they've referred to Israel and making desert bloom many more times than they've referred to the Nakba, and certainly many, many more times than they referred to the ethnic cleansing of 1947-48 uh, that depopulated uh, uh, Palestine. Um, so the media has also gone into this whole path of basically criminalizing uh, pro-Palestine protests. So the, I think it's the Globe had a story titled rallies raise question of whether Canada should have a law against public cheering of terrorism. So all the pro-Palestinian demonstrations were public cheering of terrorism. The Tristan Hopper is a National Post uh, uh, columnist or reporter. He, on Twitter, he said, Quote, so when do we declare the Palestinian flag a hate symbol? I'm not seeing a lot of them being waved by people who don't support mass murder. Barbara Perry, the supposed like, like anti-hate, uh, anti-fascist, far right, fighting the far right. Uh, uh, she's the head of the Center on Hate, Bias and Extremism at Ontario Tech University. In the Globe piece, she, she backs this new criminal changing the criminal code, uh, uh, offense to, to glo uh, around glorifying acts of terrorism. She, according to this, to protect Canadians from speech that stokes more violence in this country and to defend against the potential escalation of terrorism here and abroad. This is, this is like someone who's, she's tied in with Bernie Farber and this sort of, but, but like, you know, the unions bring this person in, uh, Barbara Perry in. And she's saying we should have these laws that you can't go protest for Palestinian rights because it's, it can be defined as uh, uh, supporting terrorism. And that's what they've done in, in France, right? In France and some other European places, I think in Germany, they've banned Palestine solidarity demonstrations in recent days. And there's an effort to bring that here uh, backed by uh, uh, some sort of pseudo uh, liberalish uh, 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 forces. 
The Globe had a piece titled Public Servant Probe for Anti-Israel Posts. And so some former Privy Council person, sort of, you know, somewhat high up in the bureaucracy in the Canadian government uh, has said things that were viewed as too critical of Israel and they're, they're going after him. Uh, Air Canada uh, fired a pilot for his Palestine protests. Uh, this was just like he put up, posted from a demonstration, you know, kind of like one of them was something like uh, uh, Israel, Hitler would be proud, I think was one of them, something like that, saying basically Israel's following Nazi tactics, you know, maybe a bit, bit extreme in the language, not exactly the language I've used, but certainly, certainly in the bounds of, of, uh, of uh, acceptable uh, protest sign. And, and, and the idea that he'd be fired for doing this, um, you know, like on the weekend, like nothing to do with his job, uh, is pretty outrageous. The federal labor minister denounced QP uh, for what it called anti-Semitic posts, right? So they went at the Globe Mail, publishing this, went at Fred Hahn, the head of QP Ontario, Canadian Uni 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 Union of Public Employees. Um, same, similarly, going after Sarah Jama, the Ontario uh, MPP, NDP MPP in Hamilton. Uh, basically, because she, same thing with Fred Hahn, she called for a ceasefire, pointed out that uh, apartheid and occupation was the root, uh, the root of all this. And so, this is, this is where we're at with the media. Uh, Robin Erbach, columnist in the Globe and Mail, she tweeted, points for alleging a Jewish conspiracy. But if QP really wanted to go full anti-Semitic trope, they should have mentioned something about poisoning the wells. And she, she, she tweeted this after quote tweeting a, a story from a, a, Globe, a Globe colleague saying, QP Ontario says it's targeted by trolls, quote, trolls, and quote, a highly organized pro-Israel lobby because they uh, recognize Palestinian rights. So basically, Erbach is saying that saying that there's a highly organized pro-Israel lobby is, uh, is, is anti-Semitic. I mean, Erbach knows full well that there's a highly organized pro-Israel lobby. It's nonsense. I mean, you just go to the website of Sija, Renee Brith, Friends of Simon Wesleyan Center, and look at how many staff members they have. I mean, it's a joke. Obviously, there's a highly organized pro-Israel lobby. The idea that this is this is the this is what the, a, a supposedly sophisticated, even liberal-minded—that's Urbach supposed to be a sort of, you know, a little bit of a feminist kind of whatever. Uh, the the fact that this is you know they try to frame calling a highly organized pro Israel lobby as 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 a trope is is not just like completely off the off the off the rocker. Um, in fact, if you look at it, if you actually are serious about it, and you you contrast, you look at the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, which is um, you know a fairly well organized uh, ethnic national whatever you want to call it exactly lobby. There's the, the Israel lobby has the amount of money the Israel lobby has so much greater than the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. Uh, so much better organized, way bigger staff, way more organization, way more of a, a structure. And it, it, depending on how you define the Israel lobby, if you, if you look at, you know, part of the Israel lobby is these private Jewish schools that explicitly say that they're trying to um, make their students. Um, advocates for Israel, and, and in case often in, in try to encourage them to join the Israeli military. Um, but anyway, so depending on exactly how you define the Israel lobby, if you go very maximalist or if you go minimalist, you know, if you just go with the main lobby organizations like the Israel on campus, the, the siege of B'nai B'rith, uh, it's way bigger, way, way better funded than Ukrainian Canadian Congress or any other sort of uh, national, ethnic, religious, whatever exa exactly how you define that uh, uh, lobby in the country. So yes, it's definitely a well-organized, a highly organized pro-Israel lobby that exists. It's not at all anti-Semitic to say that. Um, 
in terms of this, this, uh, this use of, of, obviously we've seen incredible amounts of this in recent days of, of um, basically using uh, uh, Jewish victimhood to justify uh, genocide in, in Gaza. Today in, in Ottawa, the CJ's big um, anti-Semitism face it, fight it conference began. Okay, one of the individuals that was supposed to speak, I'm not sure if he is speaking, I'm not sure if he actually ends up being stuck in Israel, this guy, Arsen Ostrovsky, who, who I've been following a lot on Twitter. He's a very prolific tw uh, 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 tweeter or ex Xer. I don't know what you call it now. Um, he, he, uh, he posts this, this message, this meme of the, an IDF boot crushing a, a, Palestinian cockroach, not a Hamas cockroach, a Palestinian cockroach. And then when he gets challenged about this genocidal meme he's sharing, he calls himself an international human rights lawyer. Then when challenged, he, he refers to them as vermin. Kind of like a little bit Palestinian, Hamas, it's a little bit unclear, savage, dissident. Okay. He's clearly referring to Palestinians, or at least people in Gaza as vermin. This is the and, and ultimately actually X actually takes the tweet down and says it's it violates their their violent speech uh, 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 policy. Um, but this is the kind of people that CJ has invited to their big anti-Semitism face it fight it conference. A real hate monger, like a real hate monger. This guy oozes anti-Palestinian hate. This guy calls for like assassinating Iranian leaders and this kind of stuff. This is the state of the, um, the sort of mobilization of, 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 of uh, anti-Semitism to justify uh, uh, genocidal policies uh, in Gaza. And unfortunately, Jagmeet Singh is, was scheduled to speak at the conference today. Well, I don't know. There's been a campaign to have him not speak. We'll see if he ends up speaking. It's today and tomorrow. Um, and and, and in, the, in the morning, this conference got set, started off with a with a statement or a press release put out with Kotler, Erwin Kotler in the prime minister's office putting out a statement. I don't know if they actually had a press conference. I think it was just a statement. And and uh, they announced the replacement for Kotler. Kotler's been a special envoy uh, to combat anti-Semitism, Holocaust remembrance, whatever the exact title is. And uh, the 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 person that they have announced take over for him as mandate uh, ended, is Deborah Lyons. I had to like, I had to like, sort of like, when seeing a name, I was like, Deb that Deborah Lyons, that's Deborah Lyons that had the pizza party for Canadians fighting IDF, right? No, can't be, that's not actually who they would have chosen to be the anti-Semitism envoy. And that's who they chose. The former Canadian ambassador to Israel, who in January of 2020, she organized a pizza party for Canadians fighting in the Israeli military. I mean, this is what like they're not. There's not even like they're not even trying to hide it anymore. That the the the, the special envoy to combat anti-Semitism. It's just a stick to beat Palestinians. It's just it's just open about it. They they don't even like. Um, it's pretty remarkable, but that's what uh, that's what uh, that's the you know state of the political uh, culture. Now, there's been a huge brouhaha about you know Jewish suffering and Jews in Canada are supposed to be scared. The, the, the Jewish General Hospital in Montreal on Friday put out a thing about, about like security threats. And, and there's a whole big thing in the media. It's like front page of the Montreal Gazette about the security threat, the Jewish General Hospital. Because Hamas official, uh, I think he's, I don't know where he's based. Um, um, uh, I don't know what his exact position with Hamas is. Called for protests on Friday. Okay, so the idea was is that the, the Jewish community in Montreal, Canada, whatever, was all like under threat because a Hamas official, I think he's in Qatar or uh, I'm not sure where, uh, called for protests. Now, if, 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 if there was Jewish institutions targeted because of this conflict, the, the Jewish General Hospital would be very low on that list. There's like way more, way many, many other institutions would be like way higher listed. I don't know exactly even what connection besides its name the Jewish general even has to, to the Jewish community anymore. Um, it's completely publicly funded, whatever, whatever. Uh, but this is the kind of like whipping up of this fear. Okay, just whipping up of this fear. 
and you see where like even even pretty like left wing, but frankly pretty left wing uh, uh, Canadian Jews is whipped up this fear like on the streets of you know Montreal it's become dangerous because what Hamas did. I mean it, like the idea this business of it, it was like a pogrom. This is the, the you know this was you know targeting Bruce MacArthur kind of like lefty-ish Toronto Star uh, columnist. Uh, he tweets out about how how you know if you opposed. Uh, he's trying to be pro-Palestinian. He said, if you oppose the, the murdering of innocent Jews, you should oppose the, the murdering of innocent Palestinians. Like, as if Hamas, what they did was because the people were Jewish. As if it wasn't because this was the people that had been, the Israelis that have been colonizing their land and ethnically cleansed them, that, et cetera, et cetera. It's just completely wild um, where this is all gone. Now, conversely, as we saw, uh, a woman here in Montreal, this, this, uh, this author, she saw a, a woman, an Arab woman with a Palestinian flag and she rammed the car and then she told her on video, you can watch this on video, she said, uh, I hope you get raped in front of your children for having a Palestinian flag. Okay. The head of the Federation CJA, the biggest Jewish federation, Jewish organization here in Montreal, he, he referred to the barbarians at the gate. Obviously, people have probably seen what happened, the horrible incident in Illinois, where a six, six-year-old Palestinian kid, Wadia Al-Fayim, was stabbed 26 times because the landlord, his, his mom was also stabbed, attacked. The landlord went on some crazy anti-Palestinian, anti-Muslim, uh, um, whatever that it seems is directly connected to all of this like anti-Palestinian, anti, you know, uh, media, whatever over the past week or so. So to the extent we have examples of real hate, the examples of real hate are being, you know, it's Palestinians, it's Arabs, Muslims that, are, that have been targeted over the past uh, nine days. Um, now, a quick note on, uh, on the NDP. The head of Ontario NDP, Merritt Stiles, her chief of staff, sent emails to all the e MPPs, reiterating, reiterating, this was leaked, reiterating my previous direction to not attend demonstrations related to the conflict on Palestine, uh, and that all public statements had to align with federal NDP and be pre-approved. Uh, unfortunately, Joel Hardin, the left-wing MPP in, um, in uh, Ottawa, who's you know, stood up for Palestinian rights, somebody who, nice, very nice guy who actually let me stay at his place uh, a few years ago uh, um, uh, when he was out of town, um, you know, real, a real lefty, totally cowed, the statement he put out, very uh, weak, totally cowed. Um, and uh, we all, that's, that's at the provincial level in Ontario. And at the federal level, of course, it was the NDP convention. And uh, there was a lot of kerfuffle. The NDP hired, and now it was announced beforehand, a report on beforehand, the NDP hired extra security uh, because they knew private security, because they knew there would be protests. And, uh, and there were, there was like there two dozen protesters to put in one report. And these just images of them being tackled. And um, uh, Gada Sasa, Palestinian woman, who's a, a PhD candidate at McMaster University, uh, she says she was tackled by security uh, at the convention, and this happened uh, just after family members were were killed uh, by Israel in Gaza. And and she she tweeted about how she might actually fe might face uh, legal uh, repercussions. So the NDP was they ended up putting up coming up with this very mediocre, not not as bad as could have been possible, but very mediocre. Uh, emergency resolution, but it doesn't have anything about, it doesn't even condemn Israel. It's sort of critical of Israel, condemns Hamas, but doesn't, they have nothing about their arms embargo, nothing about settlement products like they, their previous official position. Um, so, so we're seeing that uh, there's a, the Toronto Star had a piece by, uh, about the NDP convention just before, where they quote Naya, Niel, Niel Ricardo, talking about the shift within the NDP over the past decade on Palestine, which he says, they quote him saying, they attribute it to Jagmeet Singh. 
he says, quote, I think that it took a lot of working within the party to, to get to the place where we are now. Um, pray, and he praised Singh and foreign affairs critic Heather McPherson. So he's suggesting there's a big step forward from the NDP. Now, there was a step forward. There was a big, you know, there was a resolution that was won two years ago, and Heather McPherson had been making increasingly, the foreign affairs critic had been making, raising the issue, talking about Amnesty's apartheid report, had been, you know, more bold. Uh, uh, Singh had called for an arm, arms embargo. There was some development. Now, I think it's a really big mistake to frame this as just something that happened within the party or a change of leadership. I think it is correct. Ricardo is correct to say that there's some really important organizing by the left uh, end of the party to push the Palestine resolution. There was also the organizing last convention around the no uh, IHRA um, um, resolution. <clears throat> but that was more like kind of by independent Jewish voices kind of crowd. The Palestine resolution in the past was activist. Now, it's a really big mistake to say it was just what was why the NDP buckled was because there was inside organizing and there was outside criticism, right? And there was outside forces hitting, hitting hard, not pulling their punches, criticizing the NDP uh, on their Palestine policy. And I think it's really important to not uh, deny that outside aggressive calling them to get off the Canada Israel Interparliamentary Group. Uh, criticizing uh, uh, former um, uh, Hélène Lavardière for speaking to JNF, uh, APAC, things like that. There, the, the, so the, the, the aggressive criticism from the outside played a big role in, in softening up the, the internal uh, uh, process. And because and they, they had been, the NDP had been suppressing Palestine resolutions for decades, right? They had blocked them even being, even being allowed to be voted on. And the criticism of that was really important in softening up the leadership, uh, weakening, weakening their ability to continue doing that. And that's part of why that resolution passed last year. Now, I, I, I've actually taken longer than I planned to take to do this, but I did want to go into some historic, right? What we're seeing to some extent, this is a bit of a caricature, but to some extent, there's an effort to suggest that all of this just started nine days ago, 10 days ago, right? Hamas did something really terrible. And, you know, until that point, we weren't, you know, Israel, right? Israel wasn't, you know, a problem. And we weren't backing Israel it's because of the bad things Hamas did. And it's obviously complete nonsense and totally insane. But I think it's important to, to detail that a little bit. So first of all, with regard to the Trudeau government, They've done wildly pro-Israel things. You know, Christian Friedland saying that if we want a seat on the Security Council, it would act as an asset for Israel. Uh, uh, why would Canada being on the Security Council work as an asset for Israel? Why would, we want, why would you say that? Um, uh, I mentioned the pizza party for Canadians fighting the IDF. A voting against more than 60 UN resolutions. Uh, suing. They sued. They sued. So Canadian consumers couldn't couldn't find out the proper labels on wine, not to block wines from illegal settlements, but just have the proper labeling. Uh, they sued for, uh, against that. So the, the liberals continued on the hard line uh, anti-Palestinian pro-Israel policies of the Harper government. But those policies are rooted in a much larger history as well. Right. Zionism before before, you know, Zionists were actually uh, dispossessing Palestinians. There was this anti-Palestinian, this nascent anti-Palestinian movement in Canada, right? Henry Wentworth Monk back in 1850s, 60s, 70s, Ottawa businessman, was this Christian Zionist. He's considered the preeminent initial Canadian Zionist, calling for a dominion of Israel as part of the British Empire, right? That Jewry would be just like Canada was dominion, Australia, a Zionist state, Jewish state would be a dominion. So he raised money for this. He, he put forward a whole uh, uh, fund that's sort of similar to what later becomes the Jewish National Fund of raising money to buy the land. Or, you know, ultimately, JNF, they, they steal the land, but part of it, you know, buy the land. Um, so this is the history. And, 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 you know, through the late 1800s, particularly in the early 1900s, leading politicians cited a mix of biblical, Christian biblical and British imperial rationale for supporting Zionism. And then when 
when the Balfour Declaration of 1917, then that just, you know, Zionism in Canada just explodes because, of course, Canada's part of the British Empire. There's Canadians that helped fight to conquer Palestine uh, in 1917. The, the, and there's lots of fundraising for uh, a Zionist settlement through the early 1900s and uh, the first decade of, or first half century pre, pre uh, state formation. The, the biggest Canadian contribution to Palestinian dispossession is, of course, the, the partition plan in 1947, where the British mandate is given up to the UN. And Lester Pearson plays an important role in the initial discussions of the UN to create a United Nations Special Committee on Palestine, which goes to the Middle East to, to come up with a proposal for what to do with the British mandate. And he tries to make it as pro-Zionist as possible. He wants to bring in questions like uh, post-World War II European uh, Jewish refugees, right? Like that's part of this, you know, what Palestine, you know, what should happen with the land as if that if Palestinians were somehow responsible uh, or or should should suffer because of what the Nazis did. Uh, so he plays a big role in that. And then Ivan C. Rand, Canada's representative, Supreme Court Justice on the partition, on the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine. He's a real aggressive Zionist. He, at one point, he's pushing for a bigger Zionist state than the, Palestinian, than the Israelis or Zionists are even calling for. Ultimately, Rand is considered lead architect of the partition plan, which gives the Zionist movement 55% of historic Palestine, despite the Jewish population being less than a third, owning less than 7% of the land. From a Palestinian perspective, this is wildly unjust. Obviously, it's just in and of itself the idea that, you know, a representative from Canada and uh, Guatemala and other countries around the world, that they would be defining what happens to your homeland. That in and of itself was, was objectionable, but the actual proposal was also uh, very objectionable. And, and, uh, and it, 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 it legitimated the Zionist ethnic cleansing, right? And Canadians, hundreds of Canadians fought in the ethnic cleansing of 47, 48. The Israeli military, uh, Air Force was basically Canadian. It was headed up by a World War II Montrealer. Um, and uh, the Canadians in charge of a uh, whole uh, uh, battalion division, uh, uh, Ben Dunkelman. Um, so then you go and over the history, you look at, uh, uh, I mean, there's you know a long history. Canada's back basically every Israeli war, except for 56. I get into that if people want, but except for 56, Canada backs all of these just bombings, invasions, uh, uh, <clears throat> the the spying, right? Canada's communication security establishment has long spied for the Israelis and Palestinians for the Israelis, shared intelligence, continues to do that. Uh, all these uh, connections between Canadian intelligence, Israeli intelligence operatives, and that's why they, they turn a blind eye from, uh, for Israelis using Canadian passports to assassinate people abroad. Probably the least uh, anti-Palestinian Canadian prime minister, uh, Jean Chrétien, he signs the free trade agreement in 97 that accepts the, the products produced in illegal settlements as as uh, Israeli custom laws applies, which is de facto endorsement or recognition of Israel's occupation. Um, so there's a lot of this history is not new. Uh, this wasn't because Hamas did a bad thing. Uh, Canada has been supporting Israel's ethnic cleansing, violence, you know, since before Israel existed. Um, that's that's the history, and and now. We have a foreign minister explicitly and a government more generally and a political culture, I should say more generally, supporting uh, genocidal policies in Gaza. Um, I'll leave it at that. If people have comments and questions and whatever, I will make uh, Laura a uh, co-host. And I see Hans there. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Hans. Okay, I'm unmuted. 
Thank you, Eve. And thank you above all for having the courage to deal with the 1400 Hamas resistance fighters who shed their lives. Uh, Al Jazeera doesn't even mention them among the statistics of Palestinian dead. The so-called beheading of the babies that they are alleged to have committed has not been confirmed uh, at the highest levels. Uh, it is reported to be under investigation. Let's recall the baby deaths that were reported to be in Kuwait in 1990 as the big lie that justified the invasion uh, or the beginning of the first Iraq war. Uh, let's not take uh, any of these things for granted. They have lied to us every time there was a war. Why should we believe them now? But also, I wanted to deal with the fact, uh, and a more important one, I was probably the oldest delegate at the NDP convention over the weekend, and I was a member of the Socialist Caucus. The incident that uh, got quite wide news involved our treasurer candidate, Elizabeth Beith, and another member who participated in, is now participating in our conversation, uh, Tom Baker, who uh, stood uh, alongside the Palestinians who managed to get into the convention lobby and who in no way disrupted proceedings at the convention floor. They lifted their credentials, our credentials, uh, but uh, just the members that were in the lobby Elizabeth Weiss then was disqualified from running for the treasury position, a position that allowed her, would have allowed her to address the entire convention. Nevertheless, I want to point out that on balance, it's interesting to note that the NDP leadership has pulled back. I'm not sure what you're referring to, the fact that uh, uh, Singh was supposed to speak at a conference today. But the very agile maneuverings of Heather McPherson um, pulled back to a ceasefire resolution. These little buttons were on my uh, lapel and all of our Socialist Caucus delegation had the flag of Palestine and the slogan was the end of occupation. No one ever interfered with that. In fact, I had some suited delegates asking me for, where do I get the button? And uh, after I said, well, are you gonna wear it? Affirmative, he said, yes, I will. And he did throughout the convention. So the rank and file of the party was re-energized at this convention, which was the first live convention that we've had since the uh, revolt against Mulcair in Edmonton in 2016. And my message to all of you here is let's get in the NDP. Let's uh, re-energize it. I, I wanted to point out that the most significant attempt of the brass to administer the writing associations was repelled by my intervention. Uh, they were going to want the ad administrative power to impose trusteeship, like the union brass sometimes do on dissident locals. And this motion would have required a two thirds majority to pass because it was dealing with the constitution. Well, we turned tables on them. Two thirds of the resolution followed my call to oppose and defeat that resolution. So as probably the oldest delegate there, I pointed out that in my 16, 60 years of an ND, being an NDP, -er, I was frightened of this resolution and it resonated with the gathering. So I think uh, let's not write off the NDP. The fact that they pulled back now to a ceasefire call the word has been stricken from the administrative vocabulary by Biden's people. Uh, but it's interesting that Biden also had to 
uh, now call for a humanitarian corridor. It's interesting that Biden, that Blinken, Blinken, Blinken went back to talk to his cronies in uh, Jerusalem or Tel Aviv, uh, and he had a bit of a, constir a const concerned look on his face as he stepped off the plane, because no doubt he got an earful, certainly from Qatar, and probably most of the Arab world, which is seizing at the grassroots level, which is putting enormous pressures on their phony governments to intervene. And this may not be over. This may, in fact, be the reason why they're holding off their ground offensive, because there is a very real threat that Hezbollah will not be able to restrain, or Iran will not be able to restrain Hezbollah from jumping into the fray. One more point. When it comes to the question of who's barbarian here, let me mention the fact that the West Bank is entirely locked down. 650 odd checkpoints are closed. Vigilante gangs of settlers are beating up on Palestinian villages in the West Bank and they're backed up by IDF soldiers. Now, my recollection as a German Canadian and a Swiss German Canadian, I'm at, is that the analogy that I draw with what's happening now reminds me of what happened at the Warsaw Ghetto when the Nazi Gestapo Waffen SS fired indiscriminately into the uprising of the Warsaw Jews who knew full well that they were outnumbered, but they did not want to go to the concentration camp without resisting. End the comment. Thanks very much, Hans. We were so glad that you were there. Great action on your part. Yuri, you're up now. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Before we go on, Yuri, I didn't yeah. give Eve a chance to respond. <laughs> no problem. No, no, I think, I, yeah, I don't think I needed a response. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Yuri. Okay. Uh, Eve, I wanted to uh, ask uh, uh, if uh, I know you, I know several months ago you wrote uh, an article critical of, uh, of, uh, of this uh, indigenous uh, woman who's an advocate of. Uh, you know of you know of of the indigenous people of Canada, Sid Sid ah, Sydney Black uh, Blackstock, I think has and uh, and I'm and I'm curious, has she ever responded to that article, and has she at all raised her voice for Palestine? And uh, you also mentioned that Wab uh, Canoe apparently uh, also was you know slamming the Palestinian uh, resistance, and is he still doing that? And uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm just, I'm just curious your thoughts on that. And then, and then a, a, a final thing is, is, is I'm wondering, uh, like you, I also don't really believe in, 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 in saying to the Palestinians how they should be resisting and all of that stuff. But, uh, but, but sort of going on with what uh, Nadia said last week, where she was saying, don't you think that it would be much better? If the Palestinians uh, mobilize themselves through nonviolence, and uh, I agreed with her statement, I also agreed with your response that, well, under international law, the Palestinians do have the right to resist by any means uh, necessary and still follow, you know, the rules of war. But I also, but, 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 but don't you think that given that there was mass protests against Netanyahu and his right wing coalition and the judicial uh, uh, overhaul that they're trying to do? Uh, because, you know, that is mobilizing the Israeli left. And there were some Israelis that were also talking about, you know, that we all, that, you know, that, that we can't just end there. We also have to give justice to the Palestinians. Don't you think all of that has definitely, don't you think the, Pal the, the, the attacks of Hamas have now completely demolished any chances of the Israeli left mobilizing for Palestine justice? Because now, of course, 
the society is all following, uh, you know, Netanyahu and his ultra Zionism line of just, you know, destroy them all. I'm I'm curious for response on that. Yeah, I mean, I I I I, I, I mean, I think it's still too too early to know how this all plays out. I guess at a long, you know, at a medium, long-term historical perspective. Uh, I think you're right in that the reaction within Israeli society to this, it, the dominant reaction seems to be, from what I can tell, is like, you know, kill more Palestinians, uh, rally behind the flag, behind, you know, hardline Zionism or whatever. Um, so I don't think that Hamas was putting a whole lot of uh, um, importance on the internal Israeli politics, which uh, is probably at least partly a mistake. I can understand why Palestinians would be skeptical of, of sort of the left within Israel, because it, the left within Israel has, has often been just as anti-Palestinian, even if they're maybe better on some other issues. Uh, but I also think that, you know, realistically, this is this is this is gonna. If there is anything, you know, modicum of justice, whatever that is exactly in in terms of the you know two state or binational whatever, uh, that uh, obviously <laughs> you have to you know have some policy, some strategy of like reaching out to to the Israelis and to you know factions within Israeli society and all that kind of stuff. Um, my guess is that Hamas's calculation had more to do with uh, Saudi Arabia normalization, with uh, just, uh, you know, with just sort of anger at Israel, just more and more aggressive. I mean, Hamas has stated as much, right? Like what, Israel's done at the Alaska mosque, what Israel has been doing in the settler pogroms and, you know, that that's there. Uh, and I think it's also partly a response to, okay, we tried, we, we went, when we went, we allowed for the, you know, March of return. We it stayed peaceful for the first March of return and Israel responded brutally. And so, you know, that, that effort was tried and, and basically we want to, make Israelis feel um, a cost for the occupation, right? That's the, that's the basic, we're not just going to disappear. Uh, now, I don't, I don't know. I don't know where this all goes. I, I don't, I don't, I don't claim to, you know, and I don't, I don't think probably anyone really knows where this all, where this is all going to go uh, in the next little bit. Uh, I don't know. I think there's also, there seems to me like Hamas didn't expect that Israel's forces would sort of be so, uh, would collapse so easily. I think that's, you know, they apparently, they apparently got a whole bunch of Israeli soldiers in their pajamas. They either killed them or captured them in their pajamas. They didn't get out of bed, right? Like that's a pretty wild uh, collapse of Israel's vaunted intelligence, technology, fence. They, they were able to just like bust up all their, like their, 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 their machine guns on the fence, all the monitors, the sensors, their Hamas sent drones that basically disabled this like high tech. I, I don't, and I don't, I don't know. I, I haven't followed Israeli military technology, and I know there's lots of books about it. I, I, I'm not very knowledgeable in that, it, but it's supposed to be really good. They sell it all around the world as like we're you know top end stuff, and the Hamas was able to just basically, um, you know, immobilize it all, and so. Uh, yeah, I don't know, like, you know, what ex Hamas exactly expected to accomplish or how far they thought they'd get. Or, but it, it, it suggests, there's a lot of evidence to suggest it went far beyond what they expected to be able to achieve. Um, 
so yeah, I don't know uh, where where all this goes, but what it, what is clear what is clear is that Palestinians in Gaza, in the West Bank as well, they, they've you know last week they've killed like sixty people in the West Bank, right? Um, that that uh, but specifically in Gaza, I mean this is just just you know if if not one more bomb was dropped in Gaza or not no soldier enters or whatever it would take years and years and years to recover from what's happened already and everything suggests that this you know 3 3000 minus the 1500 Palestinian fighters is going to at least double that's what everything that's where you know this is this is going to be way beyond it's already beyond any other previous onslaught uh and it's going to be way beyond, and there's a. It seems that there's a decent chance Israel's basically trying to like ethnically cleanse half of Gaza, right, mm-hmm. <laughs> or more. I mean, that's possible, maybe even more. Uh, but but so, yeah. Uh, clearly, this needs to be. There needs to be, you know, whatever we can do to pressure the Canadian government to start. And minimum call for a ceasefire. I mean, that's a low bar. They can't call for a ceasefire, let alone condemn Israeli violence and or actually take action, right? Like, like we're not even at the realm of ceasefire, then go condemn violence, then like minimal diplomatic action, then like, you know, whatever. There's like just so many. Anyways, but uh, yeah, go ahead. Um. Wendy, you're up. Well, thank, first of all, thank you very much, Eve, for um, creating this forum where we can talk about this stuff. I really appreciate that. Um, and I want to let everybody know I'm Wendy with the Canada Boat to Gaza. And uh, the first thing I want to say about the NDP, I know that a lot of people have been, you know, trying to rally uh, and uh, be supportive of of their actions, but really they're they're a dud. They they um, they have not supported. Uh, Gaza, they have not supported Palestine in any of their any of their uh, policies, uh, any of their actions. They have silenced uh, good politicians, as Eve said. Uh, you know, they they have done everything in their power to uh, silence any kind of um, negative reaction towards uh, Israel's um, uh, genocide. And so, I just want to you know say that first. Uh, I think that we need to be thinking outside all the boxes in terms of how we respond to this. This is a genocide that we're watching on our TVs. These are children. Uh, these are uh, women who are being boxed in, who are being uh, corralled into a spot where they cannot leave. They have no water. They have no food. They have no access to the outside world. They have no electricity. So we need to respond on a on a our response has to be uh, parallel to that, right? Like we have to fight back really hard on this. And it, I don't know how we do that, um, except that we say no to all of our governments. We have to say no to all of our governments and we cannot look to a Western governments to um, support us because they're not, and they're not speaking for us. And I think that's really important for all of us to remember. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Um, so, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so Eve, should we go on? We've got two more questions. Should we go on then to Alan? Yeah, and I mean, it just, to... there, we, we need to take action. We need to rattle things and the actions need to be everything from signing petitions to email campaigns to the big, the, the hate, the seizure conference today. There was, looks like there was 20, 30 people that rallied in front of the seizure conference today to what Laurel and I did today to these we just do all these types of actions. Clearly, that's you know, it's no, it's no special. I mean, Wendy's been doing this for uh, however many decades or whatever. I'd go boat to Gaza. These are, we just need to ramp that stuff up. There is the the public sentiment. Like when they turn to the, to the whole anti-Semitism so 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 strong, it means they know they can't debate the, you know, they know the Israel support for Israel has dropped. Right, they need to put it onto a different terrain, and so uh, and the polling shows that with how many Canadians think Israel is an apartheid state or or a racist place, all that stuff. That poll that came out 
uh, two months ago, month and a half ago, uh, shows that. But uh, but clearly, when it comes to consolidating uh, the opinion, I mean, look at the mon- the demonstration here in Montreal is like towards ten thousand people uh, on like forty eight hours, right? Uh, when it comes to consolidating that opinion, we we're not that good at that. We you know so the the turning that into a force of power um, uh, is a big obstacle. Go ahead, Alan. Uh, yes, uh, I would like to vo- voice the same uh, as what so many others here are um, in their disappointment with the uh, with the NDP. Uh, this morning, I had picked up on Al Jazeera that Iran had made a, um, a statement, uh, something to the effect that if uh, Iran uh, or if Iraq, pardon me, if um, Israel came down on the uh, Palestinians so hard as to bring in uh, ground troops that that this could result in an earthquake in terms of a response. And uh, I'm a little suspicious that that may be just the reason why um, they so far at this point, although they've been threatening it, they've been holding off on that. That doesn't mean that it isn't going to happen. But on uh, and something rather synonymous with that is a statement. Perhaps some heard it on the CBC uh, in an interview with Brian Mulroney that he made a statement to the effect that uh, you know if the, the um, uh, Israelis come down too hard on uh, uh, go too too extreme with uh, what they do uh, to come down on the Palestinians that there could be a seismic shift. So uh, uh, it's uh, the whole thing as to what's going to happen is not any kind of foregone conclusion yet. So that's uh, the extent of my comments. Yeah, thanks. You're right, Alan. Um, If it's okay, Eve, we'll go ahead to John now. Just on the the question of the NDP. Uh, I've been a member of the NDP off and on uh, since the 70s. Uh, I've never, uh, and I've consistently uh, expected to be kicked out on a number of issues. I'm on the the left of the NDP. But to endorse what Hans has said, uh, you need to distinguish uh, between the NDP as an organization and whether or not you vote for it. That's entirely up to you. Or the end of the NDP as a place where progressives gather and the most likely place for progressives who may hear this message. So you don't uh, necessarily, uh, you don't join the NDP uh, uh, always with the, uh, with the view that rah, rah, the NDP, we must win the election, but rather because the NDP is where people who are political neophytes or searching for brigands of home go and those are the people you want to talk to. So, uh, yes, I understand the cynicism of the NDP, believe me, uh, but you have to z- distinguish between the NDP as the organization and the membership of the NDP, uh, where you also get a chance to work with uh, grassroots uh, union people. So it, as much as we say don't, don't condemn uh, we, we often on the other side say, well, you, you, you can't tar all Palestinians as Hamas members or whatever expletive you want to use. There's a difference in the organization and the membership, so too for the NDP. So uh, if you have a chance, join your, join your NDP uh, uh, district association and see if you can get kicked out for being a rabble rousing radical. <laughs> thank, thank you. Um, should we go on to Lynn? Um, you're, you're, okay. Yeah, that's go fine with me. Yeah, yeah. If, if, if I hadn't been a little bit more skeptical, I would have agreed with the last guy. Um, uh, and do you mean the nuclear defense provision or something? Is that what that is? NDP. No, the NDP is the the Social Democratic Party. Oh. The Social Democratic Party. What does the, it stand for? The supposedly left-wing Canadian uh, political yeah, what's party. What's the acronym? Na- uh, New Democratic Party. Oh, okay. Okay. Very Sorry. bad name. 
Okay. Uh, listen, uh, sorry, I was double dipping. I was doing Ralph Nader, Nader Hour simultaneously with you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, it's a tough, tough act, but it worked a little bit. Anyway, yeah. so so these are the social democrats and what are they doing they're standing against uh, this proliferation i take they're, it no they well, they're just they're they're not very they're they're going along with supporting the anti-palestinian policies of the government you're kidding these leftists supposedly are they origined out of canada they are they are they can, they're the third major federal party Feel sorry for you. Oh gosh, that's that's bad. Um, huh. So he was saying, in effect, that at least this is getting people involved. Or what was his argument then? Because I was. In the wrong <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't know if I want to rehash all of it. I think yeah. there's a, there's a debate on whether how much energy people on the left should put into the NDP. And oh. There's a debate on that question, and there's different perspectives, and uh, yeah, people. Putting out different perspectives. Okay. Um, what oh, I want to keep bring moving, up, Lynn. Sorry, sorry. What I wanted to bring up okay, was something. Quickly, please, because we have only. About, yeah. Time, did you know that the Louvre? Do you know? Do you, did you know that the Louvre was closed, and the Versailles Exhibit Center, and that there was a, a shoot, a, a stabbing, or a shooting, or something killed somebody, an Arab, and this was all attributed to this situation between Israel and Palestine. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to bring up, I mean, it's concerning if the Louvre is closed, um, is, is this making it unpleasant enough to be in Europe that you want to get out of Europe? I mean, I know that Israelis are, be, are leaving, going, getting sent out, uh, I mean, beyond the Middle East, not just to Lebanon, out, you know, they're getting out of their country because they're afraid. Okay, well. thank you very much, Lynn. So I'm going to, excuse me for cutting you off, but we've got a bunch of other people with questions now. We have very little time. We're past time, actually, but thank you for that. Okay, uh, Simri, sorry, I'll try to get, if you can unmute, please. Thanks. Uh, sorry, you're muted, Simri, again. Did you uh, mute yourself? Here, can you, hmm. There we go. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, I think we were we were overriding each other. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, no, I just uh, Lynn uh, touched on a lot of things I wanted to say, but basically, like it is what it is. What we have right now is the somebody said, "Would you suggest not writing to the NDP or something?" No, the NDP is the party that we have, and it's the you know the one of the parties that's in power. So use it. But in terms of system change, you know, perspective, uh, the NDP is. It's just useless. It's like, you know, the spouse of an alcoholic person who just enables them to keep doing what they're doing, but, but makes all the noises like they'll stop. It's not going to stop. They're not anti-war. They're such a disappointment to me. They're, they're just a, a, a useless appendage that enables the Liberal Party to take turns being in power with the Conservative Party. And even if they ever did get in power, I'm not convinced that they, they do anything significant, certainly not with their current leader. So uh, I'm not, I don't know what this, the solution is. I'll, of course, I've been working with Fairvote Canada since 1991 or whatever it was. I, mean, I don't know, uh, you know, proportional representation might help, but how do we get there? Um, maybe uh, next time I'm going to vote for the, uh, the Communist Party if there is a candidate in my riding, but, you know, that, that's the only other option. I've tried all the other parties except the Liberals and the Conservatives. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, you you know, so, that's it. so, so yeah, I, I consider they're just not rehabilitable and uh, they're just there to make you kind of feel good. And for the person, John, who said, you know, they're a nice, it's kind of like a nice club where we talk about socialist ideas and we, you know, and we rock the boat a little bit internally. Okay, if that makes you feel good, that's fine. But you could do that in a social community group. Uh, in terms of a political running of our country, we need a, a party that's going to gonna act with some that's going to not not facilitate all the warmongers that we're having right now. Thank you, Simri. Okay, we're Eve. I think we'll just take one last question. If or well, uh, actually, two is is two okay? We have two questions. Yeah, let's try to do this quick though, because it is okay. Okay. okay, so Elizabeth, um, can I'm trying to unmute you? Okay, go ahead. I'm unmuted. Yeah, when I was three years old, 
the SS was taking our very nice Jewish neighbor and my father tried to stop them and the SS was going to take him too. And I screamed so loud and held on to him, but he left him. So I have a very strong sense of justice. And I'm appalled that the internet, for one thing, it must be very clear to the international Jewish communities that Israel is not a safe place anymore. It's like the dead offensive in Vietnam that they realize you know, it's, it's not a safe place anymore. And they, I'm appalled that the Jewish, international Jewish community does not say this is unjust. We cannot do that to the Palestinians and that that would make a difference. But they are, seem to be very quiet and I'm appalled about that. Thank you very much. Yeah, for, for yeah I mean, I just, just, just to say quickly, I mean, I think there obviously, you know, today, like I said, today in Ottawa, there was a couple dozen people from uh, independent Jewish voices criticizing that anti-Semitism conference as being anti-Palestinian. There's been protests in Washington, D.C., even Jewish Voices for Peace. But there, there, are, there are Jewish organizations and, and uh, many members of the uh, you know, Jewish community that are critical, but, but it is completely correct that the, the dominant organizations are completely tied in with just backing Israel uh, and even even you can make a good case that even what what they call backing Israel is is kind of insane because eventually you just keep expanding you keep you keep belligerence against your neighbors eventually it's going to lead to the destruction right so you can even make a case that from a strictly like Israeli security standpoint that this is not not sensible from a medium or long term but they're completely completely you know uh, bought into this Zionistic. Jewish supremacist land expansionist uh, ideology that means that they, you know they sort of continue this this type of policy and it it has succeeded to a large extent for many decades in a, in a certain 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 sense of succeeding and it may continue to succeed for many decades but I think that if you know you live by the gun eventually you're probably going to die by the gun and um, um, unfortunately much of organized uh, jury around the world has, you know, funded this, supported this, and we're seeing right now continuing to, uh, to back these uh, uh, genocidal policies in Gaza. Okay, hey, Gassan, you're up, please. Gassan? Yeah. Uh, hi, hi. Uh, I, like, I want to uh, say first about, uh, uh, because I'm, I'm from Syria, I know, uh, I, I've been, uh, I was born there and lived there, uh, just to let you know, guys, that uh, Hamas was created by, uh, helped by Israel. Uh, they funded, they helped funding Israel, uh, Hamas. Netanyahu has, Netanyahu himself has a quote addressing his party. He said, if we want to dismantle a Palestinian state, we should support Hamas. Hamas is like all jihadists. Uh, Jihadist uh, religious group. Uh, it's an ex excuse for the imperialist power, like the United States used those jihadists as, as an excuse to bomb and, and, and destroy and send their troops. It's an excuse. They are the ones who are behind the result. They know, like, uh, like they don't know that uh, uh, Taliban. For 20, for 20 years, 50 years, they are in Afghanistan. They didn't know that Taliban was funded by Qatar. And who's Qatar? It's a small, tiny country. They cannot control Qatar. They, Qatar has, uh, has, has uh, energy, has gas, but uh, Russia was pushing 10 times more uh, Qatar, and they switched their, they stopped importing from uh, Russia like this in one day. They cannot stop Qatar. This group. It's a little bit hard to hear you, Gassan. Can you? Yeah, it's hard to hear. Yeah. Yeah. These groups, like all these jihadist groups, are created by Israel and are created by American imperialism. So uh, uh, this is uh, this is as a beginning. Like uh, the the reason is Hamas become popular because it's the only voice now. Uh, like uh, uh, Oslo, Oslo in 1990, uh, 1990, I think uh, Oslo was accord was was signed. And Palestinian president at that time, uh, Arafat, signed 
and agree on uh, 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 on uh, like Israel state and there was a, like there was a uh, in the in the accord that we have to go and establish the Palestinian state nothing happened later there is no a Palestinian state uh, and that's why Palestinians find that there is no way there is no other one who fight except Hamas why it's by design it's by design so that's that's the problem and now uh, Israel used that uh, like uh, Israel, like uh, American used that in in, in uh, Afghanistan, they used that to bomb and kill to do ethnic cleansing. Uh, so that's that's about Hamas and, and the relief. But one one more thing, I'm I'm su- I'm really surprised that you guys think some people think that NDP is still an alternative. Like I, I'm surprised. Uh, like we have the biggest problem in human history, which is the global warming. It's uh, so serious that. My daughters right now, 10 years old, are not going to live to 70 years old. Uh, uh, it is that serious. And nobody, nobody is doing anything. Liberal or liar, the, the ga- this, uh, ga- gas tax or like the energy tax, uh, whatever, it's a joke. It's, it's a joke, total joke. The biggest, the biggest polluting institution in the world is American, uh, American army. Uh, you go watch and uh, the the Abby Martin uh, documentary. It's the biggest polluting institution in the history. Yeah, and that's true, uh, Gasan. It's very true about their contribution to uh, global warming. Um, so I'm going to have talk to. About I that. think. Yeah, I think we're. Gonna, I know. I think because I I know Eve has small children. He has to do things with now. I know. I see Hans. I see you raised your hand again. But I think uh, you your call, Eve. But I think yeah, next week. Ne- maybe next week. We can yeah. continue next week because I do have the. Parental duties here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. That was a great session. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.